Hello, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about real-time optimization, a Bayesian and trust reasons approach. So the outline for the talk will be that I'll first be talking about what is real-time optimization. Then I'll explain how we use Gaussian processes in the context of real-time optimization. And more specifically, I'll talk about Bayesian optimization. Then about how we actually use trust regions, which is more a technique developed by the optimization community on top of our Gaussian process and real-time optimization approach. And finally, I'll, I'll do a bit of the analysis of our algorithm and explain some, some of the interesting times. All right, so first I'll be talking about what is real-time optimization. I need to move my image over here. So let's assume that we have some reactor and we have some inflow rate and some temperature. And we want to move this around such that we can maximize a product or some objective function which includes our product, maybe weighted by their, uh, their price or so on. Now, in general, I'll be denoting this as my input. So this is what I'm, I can move around. And Y as my outputs, which is what actually uh, I'm measuring and I want to optimize in some way. So in real-time optimization, we call our real system the plant. So here it's a reactor, but in general, it can be a process plant, an airplane. So this is just what we're going to denote as the plant. Now, the plant optimization problem in general has some performance index. So like over here, and which we want to optimize. Then it has some plant constraints, which is their expressions that we do not want to violate. So I don't know, some kind of temperature, environmental constraints, um, maybe, yeah, and so on. And we have also the plant dynamics. So this is what you would expect. So it's, it's actually this diagram just put here into a mathematical expression, which means that the inputs that go inside Y, they go to a plant, so to the dynamics of our real system, and we have our output. And finally, bounds are control. So you, you cannot move valves to infinity or minus infinity. So generally, just about around the bounds that you can move things around. And something that I want to emphasize here is that I have a superscript on Y. So this is how I'm going to denote the output of my plant. So again, the output of my real system, things that I can actually measure on my real system. And this is denoted Y of a script P. So the way that we would optimize this, again, moving myself around, is with a model. Yeah, this is model-based optimization. So notice that these two problems are very similar. The key difference is that here, the dynamics are not given by a plant. So they're not given by a real system because we have a model, which actually takes as inputs again, uh, u, but it's parameterized by some parameters theta, and we get out our y's. Now notice that here I didn't put upper script p, because this means that this is a predictor y or a model y, something that I think will happen given my model. And as we all already know, we have what's called plant model mismatch. So our models are never fully correct. And what I'm gonna be talking about is that is how if my models are not fully correct, then I can have problems or I will definitely not reach my true optimum of the plant. So what's the main idea? So let's assume that I have some starting point. This is my model's optimum, and I have my plant, my, my real plant's optimum here. So if I just optimize my model, I'll get all the way here to my wrong optimum. Now, I want to emphasize here that here what I mean is that I'm getting samples from the real system. So even if I am re-parameterizing or re-optimizing my parameters at every step, I'm still not likely, or actually, if I reach my plant's optimum, it will be more out of luck. As long as I have structural plant model mismatch, the optimum will never be the same, unless it's, it's by some, some luck. And so our algorithm actually, as you take samples, it notices that it's going in the wrong direction and it actually turns and arrives at the plant's optimum. All right, so first I'm gonna be talking about the most widely approach used in industry, which is a two-step approach. And it's called a two-step approach because again, it has an optimization phase and a parameter re-estimation phase. Again, moving myself around. So this is just an example of any model so that just so that we can understand what we're talking about. And most models will be parameterized by some parameters, which again, I'm just gonna call here generally theta. And this is my optimization problem that I was talking about where my parameters are here. 
Now, the idea is, again, that I'm going to be moving around some of the parameters. So how would the two-step approach go? So we have some starting point here. I make some step, and along the way, I get some measurements of my plant. And these are points that are over here. And then what I do is I re-estimate my parameters given on the new data. So I could have previous data. Uh, and now that, now that I'm, I'm ongoing on a process, I re-estimate them just to, to more accurately see how things are working. Then I do one optimization step over here. And then this point, then I grab again, and I include in my parameter re-estimation, I re-estimate my parameters. Uh, I optimize again, I re-estimate my parameters, optimize again, re-estimate parameters, so on, until I reach to the optimum, or what I think is the optimum. And I mean, it's likely that the optimum will not be the same as the initial model with other data. But in general, again, if you have structural plant model mismatch, it will not be the same optimum as that of the plant. And this is not only uh, some mathematical, uh, so, so something mathematically, I mean, can be shown mathematically, but it happens in several case studies. Okay, so how do we want to deal with this approach using Gaussian processes? So the main idea is, that again, I have here my plant optimization problem, and here on the right, I have my original optimization problem. Now, what I'm going to do differently is notice that I'm not going to do anything with my model or my parameters. These are going to stay the same. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert an expression here, so an equation. And that equation, I want it to be only a function of u, my inputs. And I want to have the property that it can predict the mismatch between my plant and my model. So this is, again, the error between my plant and my model. It's also called sometimes discrepancy term, right? Because it's a mo discrepancy model, sorry, because it models the discrepancy between your plant and your model. And why would I want to in insert this here? Well, again, this is not a rigorous mathematical proof, but you can see that this, if this is accurate, then these two terms cancel out, and you're left only with the plant expression, so the plant objective function and the plant constraint. And then these two problems are equivalent, so that we can solve this problem on the right, and then we get a solution to the problem on the left. Now, the idea here is, again, how are we going to construct it? Well, you could do it many ways, but we decided to use a Gaussian process. So the idea is that, again, every measurement that you take, you get the discrepancy between your plant and your model, and this is one point. So you get several points, and then you could use a regression, but again, in this case, we're using a Gaussian process so that it tells you our mean function, which is an interpolation. And this is what we depict by the one over here. So this is our function that will tell us what is the mismatch in places when we don't have measurements, right? Because in places where we have measurements, we already know what's the mismatch. Now, the nice thing about our Gaussian process is that we also have this uncertainty term over here. And this is what I'm going to be talking actually a bit more about and that we will utilize and see the benefits of using a Gaussian process. Now, this alone um, is, 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 not, is not a way to fully, uh, fully solve the problem because you have some problems with convergence and also you have several parameters which are difficult to tune in practice and the approach is not, not as robust as we would like it to be. So what we're gonna do then is we're gonna use a trust region approach instead, yeah? And so the idea is that from now on, just in terms of notation, I'm going to be talking about my, my objective function on this over here, but this is just keep in mind is the composition from my model's objective function plus the discrepancy term, just shorthand notation. And again, my algorithm will now be a trust region. Okay, so now I'll talk a bit about what, what do you mean by this trust region approach? So the best way to do it is with an example. Uh, so the important thing to notice here is that it's a it's called the williams Soto reactor. It's just one reactor with two, two, two inputs. Again, this is so that we can visualize it. It can work for many more complex problems, but this is useful in visualization. And the idea is we have a starting point over here, and we want to get to our plant optimum, which is over here. And the optimum given by our model is this one over here. No, sorry. The, model, the, the optimum given by our model is this one over here, and this is the unconstrained optimum. So we have some initial data with which we can build an initial Gaussian process. We don't need them, but it just, it's for completeness of an analysis. We have constraints, which we don't want to violate. 
And we particularly don't want to violate them at the optimum. So the optimum should not be violating the constraint, but we ideally don't want to violate also in the trajectory. And we also have trust regions. So this would be a trust region. All right, I'm going to put myself over here. So we have a starting point, yeah, which is this one over here. And what, what our algorithm would do is it would start with some initial trust region and it would do actually a Bayesian optimization inside this trust region. Again, I'll talk about Bayesian optimization a bit more later on. And then it would determine that this is the next, the next point. And again, it would do a, a, a trust region again. It would move here. And then here's something interesting happened. So what happened is that our trust region expanded. So this means that our algorithm determined that it was more confident now and that it could actually take larger steps. Now, unfortunately for our algorithm, it actually got to this point over here, which violated this constraint. And hence, we do something that we call a backtrack. So we simply go back and we reduce our trust region because this is telling our algorithm, you know what, actually you overstepped and you should reduce your trust region because you're not as, as good as you thought you were. And so an algorithm, again, it has this whole routine, which the, the details are in the paper, but they're not particularly important right now, is that our algorithm shrinks and expands its trust region depending on how well it's performing until it converges. And it theoretically, it theoretically shrinks to zero. In practice, it just shrinks to us, a very small value because also we have, a, we have noise over here. And this makes for a very robust approach to solve these kind of problems. Again, even when your model was telling you that the optimum was somewhere over here. All right, so now I'll be talking a bit about Bayesian optimization and what we call discrepancy models. So again, the thing to note is that this is our plant optimization problem that we want to solve. This is what we're doing. So we're having our optimization problem and we're, have, we're adding this discrepancy term which the discrepancy term we decided it to be a Gaussian process such that it's small. Now notice that what I've used here is I'm just putting the term for the model and just the mean of my Gaussian process. But as I mentioned, one of the main advantages of using a Gaussian process is actually taking advantage of this uncertainty term, which basically tells you given a prediction, how uncertain you are about the prediction. And this is quite a powerful tool that you can utilize, and particularly in optimization, as we'll see. So the idea is that this is the problem that we're in generally solving, yeah? Which again, I'm only using right now the, the mean, or that's what I'm telling here. So the idea here is that I have two key questions. So first of all, how to best make use of this uncertainty term, again, that I haven't yet mentioned. So how can, how can I use this uncertainty? So how, how can I, I take advantage of it on an optimization, which I'm going to talk about it, but it's called Bayesian optimization. And the second is you can see that this is actually quite a multimodal function. And so what can I do about it? How can I optimize reliably a multimodal function? So I'll first address the first question, which is how to best make use of the uncertainty term. So there's many approaches. And first I'm going to talk about three that I'm not going to do, which is knowledge gradient, entropy search, and probability of improvement. If you want to read up on them, they're all termed as Bayesian optimization approaches, and here are some nice references that you can go. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is upper confidence bound, which was um, it was actually first initiated by, or it's most widely used by the machine learning community, particularly reinforcement learning. And in reinforcement learning, people want to optimize uh, and to maximize, so that's why they call upper confidence bound but we actually want to do is minimize. So we call this lower confidence bound. So what's the main idea? The main idea is that you're not only using your mean function, again, this is my mean function, but you're also giving a bonus for the uncertainty. So you're basically saying, if you have a place with high uncertainty or with any uncertainty, I'm going to give you a bonus. And the more uncertainty you have, the more bonus I give you. Now this can be a bit quite counterintuitive, right? Like, why would you want to go to places that are uncertain? Well, this is a lot of what, again, it's known as exploration, exploitation trade-off in reinforcement learning. And I'm not gonna go fully onto it, but the main takeaway is that if, for example, maybe you have a place where you have a, an okay mean value, but you have very large uncertainty, that place can actually be very good. Uh, it can also be very bad, but 
I mean, the, the main idea here is, is called optimization uh, in the face of uncertainty and what you want to do is again, be as optimistic as you want, which is all about this. So again, we want to look for places that have some, some mean value, which generally it's an okay mean value, but particularly they have a very good potential. So very high potential of being good solutions. And I, I, I just, this is a schematic representation that here is the Gaussian process of so this image and this image are the same. And then here I show if I have two standard deviations. So here I just plotted one standard deviation. This would be the function that I'm optimizing. So the blue, the dark blue curve over here. And again, you can see that generally this is a combination of my mean function and also of how uncertain I am of that mean function. All right, so the second, so, so, so by the way, so we use this in our analysis and I'll talk a bit more about it, but this is one of the functions that we decided to optimize. The second function was expected improvement. And this has quite an ugly expression over here. And I'm not gonna explain the expression right now, but the main intuition is something that I already hinted before. So it's how much am I expected to improve? So the Gaussian process function is this one over here, which is again, the same one as over here. And the expected improvement function, which is a function of the mean function and the covariance, and some and the PDFs and the cumulative distribution function also, but again, these are details that you can read on the paper here if you're interested. But the main idea is that expected improvement is this, so of this function is this solid blue line over here, where we can see that the axes are here on the right hand side. So what expected improvement tells us is on this flat area, which is zero, by the way, it means that you're not expected to improve anything. So this is a place where you shouldn't move. So it shouldn't sample there because it's a place where, again, you have practically zero probability of, of improving your objective function. However, on these peaks, which again, they're more than zero, it means that you, there is, I mean, you're expected to improve your function. You're expected to get a better point than the one that you currently have so far. Now you might notice that this is expected improvement. And although you're minimizing a function, expected improvement is always about maximizing. So here you would, you would be looking for the highest value. So maybe in this case over here. And this is again also a function that you use for Bayesian optimization. And it's a way to use the same as upper confidence bound. It's a way to use your uncertainty to better optimize your systems, particularly when they're stochastic. Or even when you model things that are unknown, which again, you can model them as stochastic. All right, so as you might have noticed, this is a very multimodal function. So it's non-convex, but it also has many local minima, but maxima in this case. And also the upper confidence bound, you can see that it has actually many local minima. And so this is a problem, right? Because what's the point of having a very fancy function to represent your objective function if you can't really optimize it efficiently and you're just stuck in some low lying, well, low lying local minima. So yeah, yeah. So the idea is how can we optimize this multimodal function? So there's many approaches. And what we could say brute force approach are this ones over here, where you can either do a multi-start gradient-based algorithm, some stochastic search, such an evolutionary algorithm, a simulated annealing or other metaheuristics, or you combine a bit of both, so stochastic search and gradient-based. So actually, this is the one that we used, which is it's quite I mean, it's quite efficient in practice. It doesn't take too much time, but you can actually do something a bit more clever. And if you want to take a bit more time, which is something like reduced space formulation for deterministic global optimization of Gaussian processes. I think Arthur will actually talk a bit about this. So this is his reference. Or you could also do something else. Like there are some papers uh, in 1980s with, which describe Bayesian methods in global optimization also. Again, these two are more effective than this one over here. Um, but yeah, it depends. In, in this case, we, we didn't put so much time and effort, but these are very good things to use. All right, so now I'm going to be talking about what happened when we actually used uh, these algorithms. So first, this is a plot where this is the objective value. We want to reach all the way over here, and this is the number of iterations. So first of all, you can see that, I mean, it's quite reliable. You converge in quite a few number of iterations. 
Now, what I want to focus the attention here is that if you don't use the exploration term, so if you only use the mean function, like I'm putting over here, so without, without using upper confidence bound or expected improvement, then there's a point where you stagnate, yeah? Like this one over here, and you don't reach uh, your minimum. I mean, the, the reason exactly why they're explaining the paper, but this is the main takeaway. And if you use either upper confidence bound or expected improvement, you actually get you actually decrease much faster, but also you get to a much better minimum. You, you practically get to the best uh, place, although since our system are stochastic, so we have stochastic noise, you can't really, this is plots and expectation, you can't really reach the minimum. But so you have much better performance, that's the takeaway. Now, another key question that we wonder is, so actually real-time optimization, you could think about it as an expensive black box optimization problem also. And there's a whole literature of expensive black box optimization. Well, con actually ours is a constrained expensive, expensive black box optimization. There's lots of literature on it, but the main idea is that they're most of them data-driven models. Well, they're data-driven because that's what they call, that's why it's called black box. And here we're actually using a model. So we thought, okay, let's see how, how what happens if we take the model away? Will our performance be similar, better, worse? So before I go into it, it's probably very obvious that it depends a lot on the model. So if you have a terrible model that points completely in the opposite direction as your, your true optimum, then definitely it's better not to use a model. As long as if you have a perfect model that's exactly going to the, to the true optimum, then obviously it's better to use a model. Anywhere in between, it's probably unsure, but we think that as long as you have half decent model, you should use it. And this is what, what this plot says, right? So actually, uh, when you use a prior model, you decrease much faster. By the end, you get actually very near performance, but you do decrease much faster. Uh, this is mainly also because the model can be seen as a prior to um, your Bayesian optimization approach. And this is basically why if you have a good prior, then you should, you should use it. All right. So again, this was basically the talk. Just to conclude, what we did would use, we utilized techniques from Bayesian optimization or from expensive black box optimization. We combined them with techniques of real-time optimization and modified, uh, adapt, modified adaptation. And we also included uh, the use of trust regions, which is from the optimization community or nonlinear optimization community in general. And just a small commercial from me. So uh, I've just started my group at Imperial College. I work on real-time optimization, but I also work on things like reinforcement learning or machine learning applied to bioprocesses. Also, I lot with Panos, Benoit, and, um, and Eric, which are all co-authors in this work as well. And finally, if you wanna look more at some of the details that we have here, they're in this paper, which the title is a bit different from this talk.